Hey there, Academy members. These are your managers, Jason Langvey and Scott Armstrong. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we are having a discussion on performance coaching. Performance coaching while you're playing, performance coaching, and the importance of it as you transition to life beyond football. And today, joining us, we have two very... Uh, I mean, they approached us. They are experts in their field. Our first guest is Dr. Chantelle Lucier. Uh, she's a PhD in mental performance. She's a mental performance coach and founder and CEO of Elysian Insight Mental Performance Solutions, a highly sought after specialist in her field and a professional member of the Canadian Sports Psychology Association and the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. Chantelle has worked with thousands of nationally and internationally ranked competitive, elite, and pro athletes, including CFL members, NFL members, and NHL members, dancers, performing artists, executives, entrepreneurs, military, and emergency personnel. Chantelle, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And, and you can tell I didn't memorize that, right? <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> We also have uh, from Buffalo, New York, it's Eric Bond, who's the founder of The Competitor's Mentality. Uh, he's a coach to entrepreneurs, athletes, and business people. He has 10 years plus leadership and experience in corporate America. He's a former NCAA student athlete. And he also served as director of recruiting for the New York State Regional Agency of Mass Mutual for seven years. As a speaker and presenter, Eric has spoken multiple times at national recruiting conferences about strategies to recruit athletes into financial services. Numerous NCAA athletic departments have brought Eric in to speak to their student athletes to educate them on post sports journey, which is really Eric where we're driving into today. He also has a podcast, which I think is really cool. It's called the competitors mentality podcast, a native of Buffalo, New York, husband to Stephanie, dad to Erickson, and Eric, I understand you have another one on the way. Is it, so, is it so soon that we have to cut this webcast short or do we have still a few weeks to go? We got a, we got a, we got a few weeks. So yeah, another, another, little, another little Bond boy on the way. So carrying on the long line of, uh, of tough, hardy Bond boys. Okay, very cool. So I feel very lucky. And, and of course, Jason, uh, you guys know Jason, who's one of the managers of our academy. Uh, Jason also, Jason, just a little bit of your history as, as to the interest in this topic, if you can. Absolutely. This is an interesting hat I get to put on because normally I get to sit back and listen to our amazing panelists and we have a lot of them. I'm very excited to hear both of these individuals, but I also have a little bit of a background and perspective in this as I stepped away with my initial stint with the CFLPA, I went back to school, uh, went back to McMaster University um, in the Department of Kinesiology, specifically looking at sports psychology. Um, and so in that world, it really melded my academic training in psychology with the world that I've been living with, with pro sports and specifically football. And so I'm not an expert by any means, but um, the degree behind me, I did earn it and I did put the time into it. And so yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation from a personal side and from a professional side. So if you just saw that guy, that's one of the rare smiles we get of Jason online. He's happy that he's being on this. This is a really cool thing. So um, we've asked the panelists ahead of time to submit some questions just so that we can you know, field them. Um, on an ongoing basis. And this will be a conversation. So, you know, that's where we're headed. And what we want to talk about, if you're just, you know, plugging into this webcast, uh, we want to talk about the importance of performance coaching while you're playing. Uh, but we're also going to get into performance coaching to what happened, how the importance of it once we get off the playing field and we transition into another space. And both Chantel and Eric and with Jason, they're going to help guide you in just some different perspectives. So if you haven't got it out already, get the iPad out, get the laptop out if you're old school, pen and paper. But there's going to be some noteworthy comments coming on here. So let me just uh, start out with this first question. I'm going to direct it to you, Chantel. A uh, common myth in mental health and in football and life, things that you've come across in your experience. Yeah, I mean, the list could be so long, but if I was trying to sort of boil it down to a few essentials, I think a lot of times we think that um, we have to stop being human to actually be phenomenal performers. And so a lot of times we actually omit 
massive parts of what it means to be a human being, including being able to embrace having feelings and emotions, being able to embrace and accept that we're going to still have fears and doubts and, and, and things that concern us. And sometimes we think that those are actually signs of weaknesses as opposed to signs of being human. And I think that's something that's been profoundly detrimental to athletes in actually embracing the fullness of their human abilities, because those things actually are part of what make us great. They're not part of what make us weak. So I think that's something we've got to literally flip it on its head and look at it differently, because uh, we're missing part of what makes us great as human, if we think that emotions and being human is a weakness as opposed to a strength. Eric, just from your perspective, you know, uh, that align pretty much with your view, or do you have some other perspectives on it? No, I, I would say that. And I think, you know, if you look at, you know, mental health and football and life, one of the big things that, you know, I try to get across to athletes is that you're, you're more, you're more than a football player. You are, you're so much more than that. Um, you, you could be great at playing an instrument, or you might be a great parent, you might be a great son, you might be a great brother, whatever that might be. It's, it's so important to keep that in mind that you are more than what the sport is that you play. Fair enough then. So when we think about uh, playing days and uh, we're thinking about, you know, Chantel and Eric, you've, you've had people do this. What are some of the reasons that sort of get them initially interested in performance coaching? And, you know, I'm just topping out there. Whoever wants to chime in, I don't want to be the order taker here. This is just whatever, whatever, whenever you feel like you want to come in. Well, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, when I think of sort of who, who reaches out and why they reach out, um, again, the list could be long, but I think there's, it tends to fall under three main umbrellas. One of them I would say is for performance preparation. People want to reach out to a mental performance coach because they're preparing for something. They're preparing for a major event. It could be the draft. It could be an upcoming training camp or it could be an upcoming season. And they really want to optimize their preparation and they include their mental preparation as part of that. Um, the second reason I think a lot of people might turn to a mental performance coach is for performance optimization, right? So the same way that we want to really optimize our physical preparation, everything from what we do on the field, off the field, in the gym, nutrition, etc. Well, we want to make sure we're also taking care of our mental preparation. And a lot of times people haven't learned what that entails. And so seeking the guidance and the support of a mental performance coach can help you on the mental opti uh, optimization of performance. And the last one I would say would be really performance solutions, right? Um, as human beings, as athletes, we're going to encounter obstacles. There's going to be challenges. There might even be some performance slumps or ruts. And sometimes we don't know how to get through those obstacles, right? Or even when I think of athletes getting injured, for example, they're going to have support for this physical component of their return to play and their rehab, but they might also all of a sudden need some new strategies for guiding their pathway back to sport, right? So they might be looking for some performance solutions on the mental side of things as well. So in general, I would say it's probably one of these three areas, performance preparation, performance optimization, or looking to solve a problem through performance solutions um, that a performance coach could help with. Okay, Eric? I'm not so much more on, I'm not really on that mental side of things, okay. you know, that uh, Dr. Chantel is, but where, where somebody would, would want to reach out to me is, is they want to get situational knowledge of something that can help them. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it might be, they want to become an entrepreneur or, you know, they, they, they have something that they want to do on the business side and they don't quite know how to do that. And I'm, I'm a big firm believer just from my own trial and error that it's, I'd rather make an investment in myself and make a commitment to work with somebody to get me on that path and, and, sh and shrink that timeline down of getting answers to where I ultimately want to be and helping me assist me on that route. So mm -hmm. kind of, you know, th that's where I, you know, I would run into kind of some of that performance coaching, not so much on the mental side, but more on the kind of on the tactical side, I guess, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to kind of move somebody along. So maybe that this is a good chance to question. I'm going to move the questions off to the side here because this is a neat little, uh, Piece here, Chantel. You know, it's uh, players haven't been on the field now for uh, you know eighteen months or more. Type of well, you're coming back, aren't you? 
Pardon? Well, yeah, they haven't been there. They're coming back, you know, uh, early August. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, if a player, you know, hasn't, you know, hasn't played for a while, there might be some, some, you know, confidence issues and, you know, everyone's 18 months older in a, in a pro football life. That could be three years. That's a, that's a significant amount of time. How, you know, how would you engage and what's the process of looking um, at mental performance? Yeah, that's such a great question, especially in this context, right? Because we do right now have an entire cohort of athletes who who might be feeling a little bit rusty and certainly are missing the game and missing being alive in action, performing under pressure. Um, so I think really addressing the mental preparation right now is vital more than ever uh, in preparing for this return to play and this return to season. So one of the things certainly in the process when, when I first meet a new client or a new athlete, um, I do a very thorough intake process learning their history and their, and their journey, but I also do a mental skills assessment, kind of find out from a strength-based perspective, what strengths are already there that we can build on and, and improve? And then what are maybe some gaps in their knowledge uh, that could benefit their mental preparation? Um, and then of course I build a, a psychological skills training program that's really personalized to what they need. And, and we break it down, we build it backwards very strategically. Okay, you know, we're aiming for an August start, let's build it back. And how do we build the skill set so that that sense of confidence and readiness is going to be there, especially now that we've had a bit of a longer than anticipated off season. Fair enough. And if we were to do that, you know, as a player, and I'm thinking, you know, this is something I'm interested in. What are some, you know, I don't want to use the word typical easily, but what could be some of the expected improvements because we went through this process? Yeah, no, that, that's such a great and valid question, right? You want to learn, you want to know what you're going to get out of it and what's going to be game changing. Um, of course, it's going to be very specific to each individual because each individual is going to come in with their own life's, life's experience and life journeys and their own strengths as a human being and their own gaps. Uh, but in general, what I, from my experience, you know, people end up uh, definitely experiencing improved confidence, mm -hmm. improved sense of readiness, um, where all of a sudden, instead of being able to just perform under pressure, but just getting by, they actually feel like they're able to thrive in a pressure filled environment. Um, and they're going to be able to sustain that over a longer period of time. So certainly one of the things I think that's not often talked about with sports psychology and performance coaching is that a lot of times it's a career extender. Because people will be able to actually not only thrive under pressure, they'll be able to avoid burnout, and they'll frankly be able to maximize the enjoyment of their career, not just get through it. Um, and I think that keeps people engaged, inspired, motivated, and driven for much longer period of time. And then they get to really tap into and find out what their potential truly is. So those are just a few of the things that I think people can expect, uh, but hopefully gives a glimpse into the process. Shanta, how how would you know imposter syndrome kind of kind of come in after a layoff like that, where you have people that are trying to really figure out, you know, am I still good enough? Am I work, you know, worthy enough to be here in this situation? Like, where does that kind of fall in? Would you say? Oh gosh, it's such a great question, you know. And I think in sport. One of the things sometimes we forget, and, and probably like everyone on this panel, we have the pleasure of working in a few different industries, but we tend to think when we're in sport, oh, only athletes go through imposter syndrome. And the reality is that in most sectors, people will tell you imposter syndrome is incredibly common, right? We, we could look at academia, for example, and it doesn't matter how many letters we have after our names or degrees on the wall that we've worked hard to earn. You know, a lot of us at some points will experience imposter syndrome. And then when we're looking at changing careers or being a rookie once again in a new industry or, or being even, you know, new to a new new team if we're changing teams sometimes those imposter syndromes creep up again um, but i think part of it is is doing that almost like a swot analysis right doing an inventory of our strengths and remembering that we've already invested a lot into ourselves and we've probably already experienced a lot of past successes that can help us at this moment in time through this this pandemic and, and unique global experience right yeah, what do you I think Eric? I think it's I think it's disproportionately higher imposter syndrome for people that are achievers and that have achieved a lot of a lot of big things. Which obviously, when you're 
in, in professional ranks, whether it's a CFL or the NFL, I mean, you're, you're achieving things at a much higher level than 98% of the, the population that's played sports has. So I think that's something that, you know, naturally kind of would, you know, would creep into high achieving people. And the, the one thing that I, that I try to get across to, to folks is like, people think of imposter syndrome as like a, as a bug. It's like, it's like a bug in the operating system or something when I think you have to look at it as a feature. And, you know, I think if you were at the point where you don't have some level or feeling of imposter syndrome, you're not playing at a big enough level to where you really ultimately need to play at my two cents. But, you know, I, I think that that's something that a lot of people don't, they look at it as a, as a strong negative and leads that, you know, apprehension, anxiety, all the other things. But if you can kind of rewire your thought process and look at it as, as hey, that's, that's just a feature of me. I'm a high achieving person. Like if I don't have this, then I'm not playing at the stage that I should be playing at. And maybe that's an interesting point to, to sort of segue into where, Going back, just as I've described to you, Chantel, we're going back after 18 months off the field. But Eric, these are 18 months where guys have had a chance to consider what their future might be. You know, they've gotten out of the forest and flying high a little bit, and they may be thinking about themselves uh, life after the field. And, you know, I could see imposter syndrome, and I'm not an expert, but is imposter syndrome possible with that? Like, I, I don't see myself as an identity once I'm off the field. Jason, did you have a... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Before we even get into that, I think it's important really to define. I, I I have looked deeply into imposter syndrome because I agree. I think anybody that has high demand of themselves, I think at points will will have dissonance between where they're at and where they think they should be, and I think that's where imposter syndrome lives. And just to define it, it really is. It's that feeling of not being good enough for the position or, or the opportunity in front of you, not being worthy enough. And I wanted to make sure that first we had that absolutely defined because I, I love this world. And I think going back to Chantal, what you were just discussing, the belief in yourself and coming off of a, some time where you, you definitely, I think, again, this the academic in me and the world that I lived in, self-efficacy is certainly a world. The belief in your ability to succeed in whatever position you're currently in. And I think that lives hand in hand with imposter syndrome and going exactly to what you just said, Eric, I think, again, the words that I've, I've been trained in is, is about framing, right? And, and potentially negative framing of imposter syndrome versus positive framing of that fixed versus growth mindset. And I think it's just a, it's a, it's a wonderful world that we're discussing because it's not just sport. It's not just career. It's, it's, it's everything. Yeah. That's, that's a really good sort of a bedrock to, to have that conversation. So, you know, players coming back, uh, Eric, and we're thinking about, you know, perhaps retiring from football, but more importantly from moving on, can you give us some, some sense of what players and Chantel feel free to jump into what players will feel like when they're going to perhaps shed the most important identity they've had thus far in their lives. And they see sometimes a, a less than concrete uh, avatar in front of them. Sure. Um, the, the, the example that I guess I, I would give for this is San Mandel. And I don't know who's familiar with that, but it's something that Buddhist monks practice. Um, it's something that, is, and if you're not familiar with it, I'd say look it up. It, it's a process of create, it's a very meditative process for them. It's a process in general. It's very meticulous, high levels of concentration. And then once they get done with it, they take it back out to water and it washes away. And the whole message behind that is impermanence, impermanence. Nothing, nothing lasts forever. So you have to get comfortable with things lasting for a limited amount of time. Um, you have to accept change. And you have to welcome change and you have to let go and understand that there's further growth to be made. So what I would say to players that are kind of in that, that stage where, you know, things could be coming to a close, go, th go through and look up, really truly look up and kind of study what those Buddhist monks do. And it'll, it'll give you a look into what you need to do as a person to kind of get to wrap your arms and mind around a new stage of life. And it's, and it's not a bad thing. 
Like this is, this is not meant to be forever. This is meant to be for a short, finite period of time. And that's, and that is a hundred percent. Okay. So um, that's, that's probably the best example that would come to mind where I, I would kind of encourage people to look at that and, and study that a little bit to get them to a better place. Okay. Chantel. Yeah, I love that you're bringing that up. And as someone who who really appreciates a lot of lessons to be found in Buddhism, I think the the lessons around impermanence and even around non grasping mm -hmm. uh, that we find in Buddhism is it, so powerful, right? And and it makes me think too, even in this pandemic, right? One of the things I think all of us have have had to wrestle with and come to terms with and and even accept and embrace has been uncertainty which relates to important impermanence right um as someone who for example really loves the great outdoors and and is a big uh, nature fan when we look to nature we see everything in nature is cyclical it's actually not linear and I think one of the things we've done such a disservice to ourselves at this point in our human history is that we've tended to look at life in a very linear way. And we've gotten away from the fact that so much of life is a cycle, whether we look at the seasons, whether we look at the transformation, you know, of the metaphor of the butterfly or even the snake that sheds its skin. Um, we too, as human beings are gonna constantly be transforming and becoming. And I think when it comes to identity and we, we anchor our identity on that athletic, this is who I am, we forget, as, as Eric was saying before, that we are so much more than, but we also forget that in life, we are here to keep becoming and, and to get excited about change instead of fearing it, to get excited about discovery and transformation instead of fearing it. Now, will there be grief? Will there be mixed feelings? Of course, but are there also a new horizon to get excited about, you know? Absolutely there is. So so I, I love where you brought us with that, Eric, uh, with these Buddhist mentalities. Uh, that certainly is something that informs my view on it as well. So can I ask this, because some of you've had experience with the military as well, and being a professional athlete has a lot of structure involved in it. In other words, you can get on a treadmill and people will tell you what to eat, when to eat, when to play, when to sleep. And, you know, if I was to play that devil's advocate and say, you want me to start thinking about cyclicals of life? I'm just thinking about my schedule that's in front of me of the week. So it, it seems like it could for some and just some be a long migration to self-awareness and, and these kinds of things. If I'm at that beginning stage where I, you know, I, I've just followed orders, basically, you know, that's how, you know, I've done it. How do you get them thinking more introspectively, reflectively, so they start owning a little bit more of their own journey, whether that's for after football, Eric, or whether that, you know, it's wild football, Chantal. Chantal, I'll let you, I'll let you go. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things that often comes up when I'm speaking with athletes initially, um, it's that thing we call self-talk. Right, we all have that quote unquote voice in our heads that this this internal dialogue that goes on. And it'd be easy to do work around self-talk at a very superficial level. But of course, self-talk is kind of the way that I see it, it's like the tip of the iceberg. It it really, if we start to pay attention to it, if we we turn up the self-awareness, as you were saying around just getting to know ourselves better. Everyone, even early on in a career or early on in someone's growth and development, you'll start to realize, wow, I'm always in an internal dialogue with myself. Do I have a healthy dialogue with myself? Do I have a healthy relationship with myself? And how is it impacting how I'm showing up even if the schedule is made for me, mm -hmm. right? And so even young people, and I can tell you, I, I work with people of all ages, including young kids, um, people are, um, able to tell us of what that that thought process is going on and all you have to do is just help them increase the volume a little bit gain some awareness on it and then you can start doing more meaningful work around what's the emotion underlying it and what are the beliefs that then inform the emotions that inform the self-talk so it it can seem really esoteric or really um uh, far out of reach, but it's really not. This is a process that we're all doing anyway, all the time. We just may not be putting conscious energy into it, uh, but it's underneath the surface there anyway. So why not do conscious work on it instead of letting that operating system, you know, work however it wants yes, to yeah. drag around. <laughs> I always use the term you know, to curate your own thoughts or choose your own menu items, that type of thing. Yes. Eric, anything to add to that? Yeah, the, the, the word that you use about structure 
earlier, um, you know, that, that kind of jumped out to me. And I think for people in the military and, and athletes coming out of a highly structured world into a not so structured world is for some a little startling. Um, you know, and, and it just in my, in my own experience, that was something that was, you know, that was tough for me. And, and just to get, to give a little bit of background. So my, my grandfather was a Colonel in the U S army. Um, he was in D day. My, my dad was in, in the air force. You know, I grew up in a, with two, with my two biggest male role models, both being highly structured individuals. So I, I had structure, I had structure at a young age, all the way through high school, played three sports in high school, and then finally played soccer in college. And when I got out of that and into the work world for the first time, that was, it was like a, oh my God moment. Like, what, what am I, what am I going to do now? I have, you know, yeah, you have, you have somebody telling you what time to be at work or what time you have to work till. But during that day, I mean, there was a lot, you know, during those days, there was a lot of maneuverability there to what you can do and, and not being told like, okay, well, you know, report to the facility at 8am, you got a team meeting at 830. We're in the, you know, we're in the weight room at 10 o'clock. We're on the field at what, whatever the routine is, you just go bing, 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 bing. And, and all of a sudden your day's over and it's on to the next day huge, huge deal that a lot of people, you know, that really kind of struggle with. And I, and I think that, you know, you, you have to kind of shed some, I, the word I'm looking for, I guess, is, is, is armor and get a little real with yourself as to who you are from a, from a person and, and, and be honest and say, do I need help with structure? Do I need to find myself a coach? What can I do to replicate some level of structure, at least until I can get it figured out and move on going forward? But man, I'll tell you what, it, and even for somebody, like I said, somebody like me coming in, growing up in a, in a family that I did, met big military family and getting out in the world, it was still difficult for me because I was used to being told where to go all the time. And it just... It, it's tough and you just really, you got to do a little bit of soul searching and kind of figure out what you need. And, and, the, and the true thing is to be honest with yourself with what you need, because there's a lot of people out there that say, Oh, well, I'll be fine. I'm good. I'm good. This and that's like, no, 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 no. Like you need to be honest and really know yourself and, and, and know that you would need structure. So, so maybe you, you've answered this and it just hasn't been in, in structure. And just, and so here's the question. I think you may have given the answers is a player is about to you know, transition. They know what's coming in the next two or three years. And both of you, you know, been around athletes enough to know what are some of the, the biggest challenges as, as athletes approach that chasm out of fields, rink, whatever court life into the real world. What are some of the, the biggest challenge is to, so that if I'm an athlete and I'm transitioning and I'm looking for warning signs or, you know, things that uh, I should be paying attention to, what would you su suggest be on that list? Well, I mean, I, you know, the, the, the structure piece, you know, obviously is, is, is really big. And the, the other thing, you know, and I'm not going to really kind of expand any more on that. Um, the other thing that, that I try to get people to do is visualize themselves and this is going to sound corny for a second so just stay with me but with visualize themselves literally your arms are crossed you figure you're staring into a camera that's a little bit away from you and i want you to open up and see exactly what's the people that are behind you visualize the people that have coached you loved you cared about you could have been a neighbor could have been a father mother brother sister teacher, pastor, whoever it is. And once you can paint that vision of everybody that's behind you, that is, that is there for you and there to help you out as you make a transition out of sports, things become easier. I'm not going to say it's like simple piece of cake, wash your hands. But when you see all of the people that have helped build you up and you make that mental visualization with your arms crossed and say, all right, now, now this is what's up. Like I have everybody behind me and I'm going to be, I'm going to be just fine. Um, but I, you know, I think the other thing too is taking it a step further. I think players, you know, wonder if people are going to treat them the same way Is my spouse going to treat me the same way, or my kids going to, you know, look at me the same way. Um, 
you know, what, and, and that's, that's heavy stuff to process. Like, you know, are people, you know, say I get into a job, are people going to do business with me just because I was an athlete and they know who I am? Um, and, you know, or it's just, it's, it's, it, it creates a very vicious cycle that can really chew you up on the inside. So I would, I would really encourage people. And like I said, corny, totally corny, but do that mental visualization for five minutes and to see all the people that are behind you, I guarantee hundred percent that it's going to change your mind and change your viewpoint to know that you are going to be just fine. And you're going to be able to drop that armor. You're going to be able to get naked and really be your true authentic self. Okay. Um, <laughs> you got me smiling there. For, that's powerful imagery. It really is. Chantel, the, how does that strike you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whether we're talking to athletes who are still playing and or who are starting to consider um, transition, that piece Eric is bringing up about, you know, I often ask athletes, especially when I meet new people, who's on your team? And by that, you know, I tell them not who's on your team necessarily wearing the same jersey as you. Hopefully those are great teammates and you're developing really healthy bonds and relationships with them. But, you know, along the lines of what Eric was saying, who's on your team unconditionally? Right. Whether you win or lose today, whether this transition is going to have a few bumps along the way, whether there's going to be a period of unknown, who's quote unquote riding with you unconditionally. Right. And especially as, as athletes or as high performers in many different areas of our lives, we've made so much of our um, of our identity, let alone our perceived value being performance um, conditional, we need to, as Eric suggested, to really know who's actually in our lives unconditionally. There's profound power in that. Um, you know, I think the other things to, to consider, if I kind of go back to the structure and lack of structure piece, I think some of the skills, uh, well, there's so many different skills and strengths that are transferable from being an athlete to life beyond sport. Mm -hmm. And two of them that are kind of jumping out at me from what we've talked about so far, one of them is self-regulation, right? So on one hand, okay, maybe we go from a really structured environment to a period of time, including in the pandemic, where all of a sudden structure is no longer there. But it doesn't mean we don't have self-regulation skills. What we now have to combine with self-regulation skill is what I like to call agency, or the skill of leading ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I find when I'm in conversation with people and you know, especially high performing pro athlete, you ask them, you know, have you been developing your leadership skills? Most people will say, yes, I value leadership. Yes, I'm working and or building my leadership skills. So then it's just a matter of applying that to yourself. Can you now practice leading yourself? And I think that's growing our personal agency. And it's helpful while we're playing, but it's certainly going to be helpful as we look into transitioning into pro, uh, post football life, right? So self-regulation combined with agency is, is powerful stuff. So we just booked this podcast or this webcast for another hour because this topic's just getting too juicy to go. One of the challenges Jason and I have on a regular basis is players when they're finished playing football in November or December, in this case this year, is they want to check out a lot of them until training camp until next April. And if I'm using your concept of agency there, Chantel, this is a great chance to do what you would probably propose, Eric, which is build those skills so that it's going to help transfer things going. So you know, I just you know, where I'm taking you now, the the last down of the of the uh, Grey Cup. We're announced we're in the locker room and I'm feeling that, oh, I'm done. You know, last time I smelled the smelly gear, you know, and I'm, I'm going to miss the guys. But, you know, I just want to shake and bake in a holiday somewhere. What kind of self-talk? And to your point, Chantel, or dialogue, what, and Eric too, what should we actually be thinking as athletes if we're going to leverage this concept of agency and, and make progress in this next four-month opportunity? Do you want to go first, Eric? Yeah, I would say for me, and this is just my personality, take a couple of days and then punch the gas again. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I think, I think in that, in that moment, say you are in the locker room and you have a great cup and, and all of that stuff, that's fantastic. And there's going to be a lot of things that follow after that. But if maybe you didn't, you didn't, you didn't make the playoffs or you got knocked out earlier, take a couple of days, let your body heal, catch up on, on, on a few things that you haven't been able to do, but then as soon as you possibly can punch the gas and Eric, I'm going to dialogue with you on this one. So, cause the guys are going to say, no way, man, I've earned, I've earned the time off. And Jason, you feel free to jump in. So that's my self-talk going, I ain't doing what he said. I want to relax. All my friends are relaxing. 
Hold yeah, it. Sorry, oh. let me just, and I'll devil's advocate on Scott here, because I think you're probably preaching to, to very real individuals on both sides of the fence, because there's individuals that I know are booking their vacation and are making sure that they've got that month off, but I know when they're back, the gas is on. But I know that the, the younger individual if it's maturity, if it's, if it's mindset, whatever, typically the gas is being pressed even sooner than that. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that because I think our membership is both of those individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Fair, fair point. And, you know, and I, and I, and I'm not, I just want to, you know, I want to get something straight here. If you want to take time in the off season to be with your family and do all those things and you have those things scheduled out, God bless you. Like awesome. But I think, the quicker you get back into some level of productive activity, especially when it comes to trying to plan afterwards. And I have a great example. So a really good friend of mine played in the NFL for 10 years, played eight years for the Buffalo Bills, two years for the Detroit Lions. During the first three off seasons, he took internships with financial companies. And he was, he was a late, he was a late round draft pick. Didn't know he was going to stick, wound up playing probably you know, 10 more years in the NFL than he thought he was going to play. He was a starter. He played in Super Bowls. Um, you know, this is going back to when the Bills were, were, well, they're good again, but, you know, back to when they were actually good, with, you know, going to Super Bowls. He was on the last two Super Bowl teams. Um, but but what Kurt did is 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 he took, took internships at financial institutions because he knew when his playing career was over, he was going to get into financial services. Fast forward after his career is over, he works for Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor, is doing absolutely incredible things, works closely with the NFL PA, um, gets new clients that are draft picks every single year. The majority of his clients are people that, you know, come from the football world. So that's one of the reasons why I say do something, be, be, be proactive in figuring out what's next for you and start building this stuff now you know, follow, follow Kurt's model. Don't wait. And, you know, as the year, as, as the years went on for Kurt, he kind of backed off doing that because he knew that he was going to be in the league for a little while, just signed a new contract, making millions of dollars a year well before tax. Um, and, you know, and, and, but he's, he kind of took his foot off the gas, but he didn't do that until he got comfortable enough with the fact that he knew he was going to be in the game for a while. So really take it, you know, for those younger guys that are in the league and you're in your first couple of years, you have to do something like that. You have to do something really structured you know, to, to do an internship, do something along those lines in something that you love that could be a passion of yours or maybe experiment, maybe do an internship with one, you know, one type of career, one off season, look for an internship in a different type of career, the next off season, mix it up. And, and that's a great time for you to really play around with what you think you could be passionate about because you have income coming in. You're in a optimal situation. The cards are in your hand. Use it. Chantel, we're just throwing the long bomb over to you there to pick up on that uh, one. No, I'm loving all of this because, you know, I'm not here to contradict anybody because I, I really feel like this is a situation where it's an and as opposed to an or, you know. Yes. Um, I think on one hand, the recovery post-season piece, um, I think in high performance and pro sport, recovery gets a bad rap and all too often is the thing that's not honored well enough. It's a hard sell for probably about half of the membership, uh, but it's one that I'm devoted to because I think both physical and mental recovery will allow sustainable excellence to actually exist, will allow careers to be sustained over a long haul. However, recovery, a lot of times it's like self-care. People think, you know, oh, self-care, bubble baths or hanging out on the couch or playing video games for hours and hours. If you sit on the couch too long, you feel like crap, right? And so the idea is, is active recovery. And so I think athletes are starting to understand what that looks like physically. They might need to take a couple of days away from the gym, heal their bodies, honor their bodies, but it doesn't mean sleeping and being on the couch all day. So same thing mentally. And as Eric was saying, what can you do to keep yourself mentally engaged, inspired, growing and learning? Well, from a career perspective, that could be internships. It could also be things like volunteering. 
You know, I look at um, my profession now, my second career um, as a mental performance coach, I ended up volunteering with my dog who was trained in animal assisted therapy. And we volunteered for almost 10 years in hospitals and school settings. I did that once a year, uh, or sorry, once a week. It was something I was I just loved and it was quality time with my dog doing something I believed in of service to my community. But guess what? I ended up growing and developing my counseling skills so meaningfully by doing that. And it literally took an hour or two hours out of every week. Uh, no more than that, but it was meaningful, right? So I think this is where we have to look at an off season. Um, and we do have to have a bit of a structured plan. I mean, the clients I work with, we not only work on having a plan and goal setting in season, we actually set some meaningful off season goals so that they can balance that family time, couples time, living and relaxing time with some meaningful career building and growth and learning um, and off season training. So I think it's an end. There's there's room for both, everything in good dosage. So totally let's, talk, let's talk about the, the passions then or, or the career after sport, because that is a huge, you know, game roadblock. Uh, you know, I don't want to think about it kind of place because their identity has been wrapped up in one thing for so long. Um, I think we can all agree that players underestimate the skills that they've acquired in professional sport as they transfer to the professional world. But, you know, a lot of players, uh, it's, it's, they don't know what they want to do. And so I'm interested to discuss as we started to do is how do I explore these kinds of things? And then to the more pragmatic side, that if I'm making, you know, 80,000, 100,000, whatever in pro football, I probably have familial obligations. So, you know, how does that, what are my financial requirements piece? fit into the career that I should be looking at? Is, is that a fair enough question to sort of punt over to you folks? Sure. Well, the, the the first piece of that, you know, when you're trying to figure out what to do post playing career from, from a career perspective, one of the things that I teach is it's called three P's. So passion, proficiency, and profitability. Um, number The number one piece of that is passion. Figuring out what you have a passion for literally make a list of things that you're passionate about. In the next column over, off of those passions, figure out what you're proficient at. So then you take your passions and your proficiencies, and then you figure out what's the most profitable out of that, out of that group. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and it's, it, it's just really a, a, a compare, a mix and match. And, you know, if you love finances and you have a proficiency with, you know, numbers and stock market and all the other things, well, might lead you in the direction of becoming a financial advisor. I don't know. I mean, if you, um, if you love putting fires on me or fire, I don't know, maybe you're a firefighter, but I mean, you, that's, that's what I, I encourage everybody and I teach everybody to do is number one, the passion is the ignition switch. That's what lights, that's what turns the engine on get into a proficient, figure out what you're proficient in. We all have things that we're proficient at. Some of us more than others, me less than others, but you know, we all have things that we, that we do really, really well. And then just match those two things together. What's going to make you the most money? Because I think when you're transitioning out of a, you know, out of a career that, you know, maybe you're, you know, making a hundred, hundred and ten, hundred twenty thousand dollars you want to at least find something that you can, get into that's similar. Maybe if it's a step back for a shorter period of time to where you're, you're acquiring, you're growing and you're getting better, like, like maybe being a financial advisor, you might see it step back a little bit in income, but within a year or two, you can work your way back up to that. Um, so I think that's, that's the big thing that I would, I would get across to people is really figure out your three P's and how that, and how you can apply that um, to figure out a career for you. So if I can, Eric, just while we're there, because it's a good point, I want to add a, a fourth letter there. It's not a P, it's a T, which is time. And that's where a lot of players will go to the easy launch place. You know, they may have a passion about something, but that means going back to school for three or four years. And, and you know, they say, no, you know, I'm, I'm more just, what can I get up and running very soon? How, how would you uh, counsel somebody who is sort of wrestling with that, that time difference? Um, well, to, to me, I mean, it, it, like I said, it all it all comes back to following your passions and, and what what are you what are you going to be most passionate about? 
And I, I don't want to see, I would not want to see somebody get into something short term. <laughs> you know, um, Rob, Peter, well, how's that go? Peter and Paul, you rob, rob the one to give to the other. I don't know how that goes, but like I said, I'm not the sharpest knife in the box, but I, I would hate to see somebody get into something that they're not happy with to make ends meet. Like I get sometimes that that's a necessity, but ultimately you're not going to be satisfied with that. And on top of that, you're already going through a, a little bit of a change of leaving something that you are passionate about, that you truly love, that you're known for, that you don't want to add a level of difficulty on top of that. So that's also why do a lot doing a lot of the stuff before you get out of your career is so vitally important. So you have, and you can plan and get in, but I, I, I really don't know, Scott. I mean, the biggest thing is, uh, is I, I just tell everybody to really truly follow your passions and, and really try to figure and, and figure that out quick. And the other thing on top of that is, is going back to finding somebody that has situational knowledge of something. If you can hire a coach or hire a mentor, which is, I've learned that lesson the hard way. I mean, obviously I'm a little bit partial to it now because I am a coach, um, but I've also wasted thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on things instead of just finding somebody with situational knowledge and then going to them, paying them at a the reasonable price and getting that timeline shrunk down a little bit quicker. Fantastic. I think what you're saying is we need to stand on the shoulders of giants which is one of my favorite sayings. Can I, can I just do a quick turn here? And I think this will segue nicely for Chantel because I really love where we're talking because I think mindfulness, self-awareness are, are important. They're massively important for the development of, of any individual, specifically high achieving as an athlete transitioning. And I think that one of the things, one of the terms that I keep coming up with within this world is vulnerability and the willingness to be vulnerable. And can I just maybe just throw that word out there for you two to maybe talk about in this? Because I think that's that's really where we're at. The precipice is the willingness to be vulnerable in that new new world, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to pause there, folks. Thanks very much for being here. Um, Chantel, Eric, it's been absolutely fantastic. Are you guys ready to come back for round two? Let's go. Okay. On behalf of the Academy, thanks very much for everyone joining us. Uh, we will have the second podcast up shortly. Webcast, I should say. Thanks very much.